I'm Elizabeth Hines and welcome to Coast Connections from home. So we've got a riddle for you. What has nine brains, a beak like a parrot, has blue blood, has an armpit, uh, an, a mouth under its armpit, 1600 suckers, is the size of a full grown man, but can now actually squeeze through an opening the size of an orange. To solve that riddle today, we have our guest, Mr. Jim Cosgrove, marine biologist and author. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Liz. And you're also uh, connecting with us from home, your motorhome. Yes, uh, yeah, my wife and I have lived in a motorhome for uh, three and a half years now, and we do a lot of traveling, so. Nice. Still get into the ocean every once in a while. You're the mobile marine biologist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you got to get along really well with your partner if you're spending that much time in a motorhome, so congrats oh, yeah. to you. Yes, uh, yeah, we are well matched. We've uh, been together for 49 years now, so we're getting used to it. It's <laughs> Tremendous. So, James, what sparked your interest? What inspired you to study octopuses so um, thoroughly? Um, when I was growing up, uh, my parents were in the military, and we traveled back and forth between British Columbia and Nova Scotia. Uh, when I was in Nova Scotia, I learned how to dive, uh, but they don't have any octopus there, and uh, the area I lived in was very difficult to, to dive in as well. So. When we got back to British Columbia, I started diving here, and my big challenge was to see if I could find an octopus, and eventually I knew what to look for, uh, and that just started asking questions. If I saw an, an octopus again next week in the same place, was that the same animal, or was that different? And how did you tell? And from then, it was just more and more questions that I tried my best to find some answers for. Mm. And you've compiled those answers in a beautiful book called Super Suckers, The Giant Pacific Octopus. And you're a co-author of that with uh, your co-author is Neil McDaniel. Yeah, Neil was the editor of Diver Magazine for many years. He's a tremendous underwater photographer, really nice person to work with. So when I retired from the Royal BC Museum, uh, Neil asked if we wanted to collaborate on a book, and it turned out to be uh, just a lot of fun for us. Very good. And the book is published right here in BC by um, Harbor... Harbor Publishing, yep, up mm -hmm. in uh, Pender Harbor, yeah. Right on. So it's nice to know it's written here, produced here, published here. So. Yeah, it's, it's a local book. Lo local book. And I just want to comment on your amazing octopus t-shirt you have there, Jim. Oh, right. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I have Let's, a large assortment of octopus t-shirts. And to honor the octopus today, I'm wearing my octopus earrings. And I also have this amazing um, octopus ring. Very cool. <laughs> Only available in the finest gift shops around the world. <laughs> <laughs> so. so let's get started. Let's talk about this amazing, intelligent, gentle animal. And uh, first of all, is it octopuses or octopi? Uh, octopuses, uh, because octopus is a Greek word. And so when you pluralize a Greek word, it generally ends up in O-D-E-S. So for true uh, accuracy, it would be octopodes. Uh, octopi, if it was uh, an Italian or a Latin uh, word, would be fine. But octopi are kind of eight-sided tarts. Uh, that's edible. <laughs> and they're part of the, is it the cephalopod uh, family, Jim? Yep, cephalopods in, incorporate nautilus, uh, squids, cuttlefish, and octopuses. And mm -hmm. they belong to a group, a large group, uh, called the mollusks, which are clams and uh, chitons, all of those kinds of she uh, shelled fish. And how uh, old are octopuses? How long they've been on the planet, Jim? Uh, if you go back to the very first cephalopods, they were called belemnites, and they lived about a half a billion years ago. That's B billion, 500 million years ago. Uh, evolutionarily, they changed quite a bit, and somewhere around 140 million years ago, uh, 
uh, when there was a, a big extinction event. This is when all the dinosaurs disappeared. Uh, most of the ammonites and nautiloids died out then. We have only two uh, species of uh, uh, groups of uh, nautilus that have survived, and that's when the octopuses and the squids, uh, the modern ones, started to, to show up. So about 140 million years for, uh, wow. for an octopus now. Wow, they've got some staying power. Yeah. And right. Jim, are they found in all of the oceans of the world? Yes. Yes. Yeah, as far as, as we know, uh, there are roughly 200 species, although uh, the more we explore the really deep oceans, the more we're finding. Uh, but uh, yes, they're all marine. There are no freshwater octopuses. Mm -hmm. And uh, contrary to popular belief, there are no octopuses in trees either. Uh, one of my friends produced a little website on the Pacific Northwest tree octopus and uh, it's been very popular, and unfortunately, some people believe it's real. <laughs> I wonder what kind of seeds you'd have to plant for that. <laughs> <laughs> now, Jim, you're a diver, and we have um, some amazing video footage here that your co-author, Neil McDaniel, took. And let us we're going to do a deep dive into the ocean now and just take a peek at these beautiful creatures underwater. And I believe this one that we're seeing is a giant Pacific octopus. Is it, Jim? Yes, yeah, that's what we've referred to as a GPO. Mm -hmm. Beautiful sort of purplish color as we're seeing um, him or her, I'm not quite sure at the moment. But they have amazing abilities to camouflage themselves. And we'll talk a little more, more about that after the video as well. Um, during this, you can see that um, the octopus is using like almost looks like gills or something on the side of his head. What's going on there? Yeah, so that big head part is called a mantle. Mm -hmm. And there are two gill slits on either side. So as it breathes in, uh, it opens those up and expands the mantle. That pulls water in, and the water goes over the gills. And then when it closes them, it's actually blowing water out of the siphon. Uh, mm -hmm. So water goes in through the gill slits, out through the siphon. Mm -hmm. And in the video, it's also expelling a very dark, murky substance. Tell us what that is, Jim. Yeah, so all of the waste comes out there, but also uh, octopuses have ink uh, in them now. In, the, in GPOs, the ink is kind of a dark brown, uh, almost purpley. Uh, and so it will blow that ink right at the face of a predator, uh, hoping to create a cloud uh, that the predator can't see through, and then the octopus will try and escape out the, out the other side. Wow. Now, is that ink um, venomous, or is that separate from venom that an octopus might have? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's not venomous. Uh, it won't hurt you. Uh, mm -hmm. In some octopuses, uh, that ink has uh, a quality that will deaden the ability of the predator's smell. So, for example, moray eels will feed on uh, some species of octopus, and uh, that ink will deaden the, uh, the olfactory capability of the moray so it can't smell or, or find the octopus. That's not the case in ours. Most of ours are visual hunters uh, like seals and sea lions. And so you want to create a uh, screen that makes it difficult for them to see through. Mm -hmm. And um, Jim, what makes uh, a giant Pacific octopus giant? We have uh, the ideal uh, climate for them right here. Now, uh, GPOs live from uh, Japan and Korea all the way through the north part of uh, uh, the Pacific Ocean, the Bering Sea, and then down to California. So we have a combination here of cool water that holds a fair bit of oxygen, uh, and that's a, a critical factor for them. Warm water holds less oxygen. The, oct uh, the octopuses are smaller in warm water situations. How much would a fully grown adult uh, GPO weigh? Uh, the biggest one that uh, I've ever documented was 156 pounds. So that was about 71 kilograms. And it measured about uh, 22 feet uh, across in radial arm span. So, Impressive. Uh, yeah, some of the wow. literature lists things up to about 500 pounds. Uh, 
I think those are mistaken, uh, and I noticed that the latest book of uh, the Guinness Book of World Records uh, lists the octopus that I documented uh, as the, the largest recorded. Jim, have you ever touched one? Oh, hundreds, thousands, yes. Yeah. <laughs> do you need gloves? Uh, it's best if you do. Um, octopuses, uh, suckers are what we call chemotactic. They taste what they touch. And so uh, letting them get onto bare skin is not a good idea. Uh, in my book, I've documented a couple of situations where people have been bitten, uh, mostly in aquarium situations where they, you know, they've let the octopus get uh, onto their arm or onto their hand. But uh, that can be a real problem. They have a, a fairly serious bite. Right. Have you ever been bitten? Uh, only by small ones. We have a second kind of octopus called a ruby octopus uh, that's not very big, only weighs three or four hundred grams. Uh, and so handling them, I often have to do that barehanded. And yes, I've been bitten a couple of times by them. Jim, we're going to take a look now at some of these amazing pictures that um, Neil McDaniel has provided. Um, the first one we have is this red octopus swimming through the water. Is this a ruby octopus? Yeah, uh, no, this is a, a GPO, I think, uh, and uh, they have the capability of moving by jet propulsion. So as we mentioned before, water is drawn into the mantle and then pushed quite forcefully out the siphon. Uh, and the siphon works like a little fire hose, and uh, so the octopus gets pushed through the water. Beautiful. Uh, the next one we have is an octopus sitting on the ocean floor, and this one shows the loose webbing between its arms which is quite fascinating. Yeah. And under one of those, the, the mouth uh, uh, lives, right? That's right. So it's, those uh, that webbing is called an interbrachial web, means between arms. And when an octopus feeds, it actually scoops the food up inside those uh, arms. So the webbing forms a sack of water underneath the octopus. And then the uh -huh. octopus pushes a poison uh, or a venom into the water there that causes the, the prey, either a crab or, some, or a shrimp, to go to sleep. Uh, and then it, then it eats uh, the, uh, the, uh, the prey item uh, using its beak uh, and a very uh, muscular tongue called a radula it actually has oh. teeth on it. Nice way to, you know, look yep. after your prey, put them to sleep first. Yep. Well, and that <laughs> yeah. is... That way the octopus doesn't get pinched either. That's true, because they're quite vulnerable. And they're arms that can regenerate, right, Jim? Yes, they mm -hmm. uh, have tremendous capability and regenerative powers. Uh, one of the interesting things in science is to try and figure out how uh, such an evolved, highly evolved animal as the octopus can generate uh, new body parts so quickly. If we can figure that That's out, uh, it might be very beneficial for humans. Mm-hmm. The next picture we have is this um, octopus lying on the ocean floor. It's eyes wide open. If you look at about the lower third of the photo and just left of center, above the suckers, you'll see um, the wide open eye of the octopus surrounded by um, suckers. And they have about, what, 1,600 suckers, Jim? Depends on the, the age uh, and the size. But yeah, so when they start off uh, very, very tiny little octopuses, uh, they only have five or six suckers on each. Uh, arm as they grow, they grow more and more suckers, so they can get up to 200, 250 per arm. James, uh, the other picture we got is the octopus eye closed that's with a horizontal slit. This is a really good close up shot of an octopus eye. Yeah, and octopuses have uh, excellent vision, their vision is as good as yours or mine, although they see uh, in black and white. Uh, oh. But their eyes are built the exact opposite of a human eye. Uh, because an octopus has no bones, uh, it doesn't have a skull that uh, the eye has to sit in. Consequently, uh, in a human, uh, we have a fixed eyeball, uh, we have a lens that gets thicker or thinner uh, to focus light on a, on a point, whereas the octopus has uh, a lens that's fixed and then it can lengthen or shorten the entire eyeball. Uh, to fix the uh, the light on a point. 
That's fascinating. What amazing, intelligent, beautiful, complex, alien creatures these are. They're just so super. Um, now, the octopus siphon. This is a very interesting part of the anatomy. I don't think any other creature has this. A beautiful close-up here of the siphon. Yeah, and so as I mentioned, that, uh, that tube uh, is where the water comes out. All the body wastes come out of there. All the reproductive uh, material comes out of there. But the, most of its uh, most of the siphon is used as a uh, an o, uh, kind of a hose like uh, object, so that it can actually use blasted water to drill into the bottom. So if it's trying to wow. dig out a, a clam or a mussel or something like that, uh, and then as we saw in the previous uh, photograph, when it's flying through the water, uh, it jets that. Uh, uh, water down the length of the arms and the arms will fan out so the interbrachial web actually act, acts like a wing uh, so they can literally fly underwater. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, the next shot we have is actually of an octopus midden, Jim, yep. and it's outside the den and it looks like all the prey discards are sitting around here. What have we got? So octopuses, because they have very little in the way of protective uh, coloration or spines or all of that kind of thing, uh, will make short hunting forays. So they will go out, they'll find as many crabs or shrimp or uh, whatever that they can find, and then they'll take it back to their den. So inside the den, which is usually a, a big rock, uh, underneath a big rock, uh, then they can consume the prey, and then when they're finished with it, whatever the hard bits are, crab shells and that kind of thing, that's what we see in the midden here, uh, they get ejected out onto the front porch. So uh, the in inside of the den is uh, clean. They don't get any bacteria or anything growing in there, uh, but they are kind of messy neighbors. <laughs> clean on the inside, a little bit not so much on the outside. Exactly right. Jim, one of the most fascinating um, aspects of the octopuses is the whole reproduction process. Um, we have some beautiful photos here of octopus eggs that are close up. They're like little pearls. You see little eyes that are actually within the egg, and there's perfectly formed babies in there. And these little pearls have like a string-like um, attachment on them, which the female octopus braids into like clusters of grapes, which is like a veil of eggs. Yep. Yeah, so uh, when they reach sexual maturity in both uh, males and females, roughly uh, age uh, oh, two and a half to three years, uh, uh, once the female uh, is ready to reproduce, uh, she will mate with uh, a number of different males uh, and she stores the sperm in a special spot inside her body. Uh, wow. And then when she's ready, uh, and that may be as much as six months after mating, uh, she'll find a place that, uh, that suits her. She often will pull rocks from all over the place and wall up the den. Uh, and then uh, when she crawls inside, she'll just reach out, pull out the, the last of the rocks, seal off the den completely. For the next month, uh, she'll spend four or five hours a day turned upside down against the roof of the den. Uh, and as she produces the eggs, one single egg at a time, she fertilizes it. And she'll hold that egg with that little string-like structure you, you mentioned. Uh, and as she produces another egg, those strings get woven together. So when she's got roughly 100 to 150 eggs on a string, she glues that to the roof of the den using uh, um, saliva that she produces. A full nest. Unbelievable. Yeah. That is so full unbelievable. Nest. And she aerates them and cleans them for how long is the gestation period? So, some, uh, well, brooding period because she's not gestating them, but yeah. brooding period is uh, someplace between four and 11 months, depending on water temperature. And she doesn't eat during the brooding time, does she? No, she does not. Yeah, so at, at the end of it, uh, she is going to uh, pass away. Uh, her life is, is spent at that point. She will have lost more than 50% of her body weight uh, just using up the energy to 
keep yourself alive, keep the nest clean and free of predators. Wow. And when these eggs hatch, you've got a perfectly formed little baby octopus, which just is on its own as soon as it's birthed, right? Yep. In, in the case of the giant Pacific octopus, uh, this is what we call a small egg octopus. So she produces a large number of eggs, close to 80,000. Uh, and when they hatch, the very first thing they do is swim up to the surface of the ocean. And they actually turn it upside down and they can cling to the underside of the interface. And then they drift for pretty close to a year up there until they gain enough weight that they can't stay there anymore and they fall down. So at that point, they're fed on by everything from baleen whales uh, to all kinds of fishes and jellyfish. Once they get uh -huh. down to the bottom, then that's a whole different kind of predators. And as, as they get larger and larger, eventually they'll be, end up being food for harbor seals and sea lions. Mm -hmm. And would an orca take an octopus as well? Is that Probably would if it found one in midwater, although uh, the orcas are really fussy uh, in the food they eat. The, the transient orcas eat mammals, and the resident orcas eat uh, Chinook salmon mostly. So uh, harbor seal would be far more of a uh, predator than an orca. Now, Jim, we've taken a deep dive with the octopuses. Um, now I also want to show um, our viewers a video of an octopus actually in a tide pool, right here in the local waters on Georgia Strait, just off of Bowser. We've got a beautiful little video here by my friend, Jenny Krokopenko. Um, and she was out, this is March 2017, during sa uh, herring season. And the beach was full of herring plopping around, uh, left behind by the receding water. It was very low tide in midday. And she was running around picking up herring that were plopping in the sand and putting them back in the water. <laughs> <laughs> she saw in a really sh uh, shallow tide pool what looked like red sea foliage, some kind of kelp, and then it moved. Um, the head was the size of a watermelon, and Jenny thought the octopus didn't have enough water in its tide pool and tried to save it. So she put um, a bucket down beside the octopus and scooped it up and took it to, out to the tide to release it. Um, but the octopus wouldn't let go of the bucket. So she laid the bucket down in the water and he crawled out straight back to the tide pool that she'd rescued it from. So this video is the journey back to his pool. And once he got there, the octopus started making the pool deeper by hiving out rocks from below and making his pool deeper to sort of disguise himself and make sure he doesn't get rescued again. <laughs> I didn't know octopus would go in such shallow water. They will indeed uh, go into very shallow water. Uh, uh, if there's food available and they, uh, uh, you know, they, they know that they've uh, got experience in hunting that way, uh, mm -hmm. often they can just send their arms up into the shallows and because the suckers taste food, they can probe in and underneath rocks and that kind of thing without, uh, without them getting out to the point where they can't, uh, can't breathe anymore. Right. Uh, also, it's a way for them to escape from, uh, from predators. So if you get uh, uh, animals like harbor seals or sea lions or up in Alaska uh, where you get sea otters, uh, right. then the octopuses will actually stay up in very shallow water. And that's one of the things they do is they dig a little pit uh, that will have water in it while the tide goes out. And then uh, they'll stay there safe and away from the predators. That's amazing. This one was probably... Uh, aware that there were uh, fish available uh, up there and so it was just uh, kind of coming up. It may have been gathering the uh, the herring down underneath its web uh, to, you know, when it had a load of them then it would go back to its den. Mm -hmm. So what should we do if we happen upon an octopus, if we have the pleasure of happening upon one? Um, basically leave them alone. They're very powerful animals. Uh, and uh, you don't want them to get onto your skin. Uh, even if they don't bite you, they, uh, they can pull hard enough on your skin to uh, uh, cause welts on your skin and that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, they're wonderful to watch. Uh, they're quite amazing uh, animals to, to look at, uh, but they're best just left alone to do what they do. Mm -hmm. 
Jim, we have about a minute and a half left, and I just want to talk about uh, what threats that face octopus and what how we can help to protect them. Well, the, the big thing with uh, these animals is because they are so very short-lived uh, that if they start, uh, if somebody's, for example, started doing a commercial harvest uh, and taking a lot of them, uh, within a couple of years you would find that there were none because they, they just don't reproduce that fast. Mm -hmm. uh, the other very thing that they're sensitive to is the amount of oxygen in the water. And with global warming, as uh, the oceans warm up and become a little bit more acidic, uh, these animals are going to be forced to go deeper and deeper uh, into that cool water that holds more oxygen for them. So, uh, you know, if we're going to harvest them, it has to be done uh, in a very controlled and very scientific manner. Uh, People have tried to raise them. Uh, they take way too much food to make a commercial uh, industry out of them. So uh, just, you know, take take one or two uh, if uh, if you want <clears throat> want them for dinner. But other than that, just leave them be. Jim Cosgrove, marine biologist and co-author of Super Suckers, the giant Pacific octopus. Thank you so much for all the information you've imparted to us today. Do you have any closing thoughts, Jim, before we wrap it up here? No, thank you very much for allowing me to share my science with your audience. It's been a pleasure to have you on board and I wish you safety on your next deep dive and uh, hope you find some more uh, amazing octopus that you can photograph for us as well. And good luck with your book, You and to Neil McDaniel. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us today for this very special episode about octopuses, the giant Pacific octopus right here in our waters in the Pacific Northwest. We hope we've given you at least eight good reasons to enjoy and appreciate these beautiful, graceful, intelligent animals. Thank you, and we'll see you next time on Coast Connections.